in discussion agenda number 17 discussion first reading of bond resolution for spring bond issuance exhibit f i'm going to ask ms rolls to come forward to bring forth our spring bond issuance resolution um, virtually he is uh, tuning in so he can hear us and we'll be able to answer any questions that you may have regarding the resolution. Wanted to remind you all of the timeline. We talked about the capital projects back in October. We've had the workshop. We discussed the spring bond issuance at our last meeting. Um, and this will be the first reading of the proposed bond resolution. As we um, also discussed at the last meeting, if we continue with the 69.5 mills for the debt service millage, as is our current rate, um, our 8% constitutional debt limit is based on our assessed property value in our district. That's at 46,910,641. Our annual maintenance includes technology, and this coming year we are working um, on increasing our, fire, our security firewalls. Uh, that will be 15,000. That will also be some of the funding for the Chapin High School Stadium. Uh, 2022 portion of the Irmo High School East Wing construction project at 34 million. Um, I wanna point out that these payments are going to be spread over eight years. And the reason for that is to ensure that we have it structured so that it gives you all the maximum amount of flexibility in that. Um, the importance of uh, issuing all of this is if we do not issue this 49 million, then our millage rate would have to be adjusted. So it is very important that we do this in order to continue with our plan for the next five years that we have discussed. So we need to make sure we're maximizing our 8% constitutional debt limit. These were the projects on the $15, or $15 million maintenance program that were approved back in October. Uh, includes the Chapin High School Stadium uh, expansion, the Crossroads Middle School roof, Dutch Fork High School track replacement, replacing the turf at Dutch Fork High School, Chapin High School, and Irmo High School, purchase of an activity bus. Like I talked about earlier, the uh, technology will be focusing on our firewalls this year and a small amount of contingency for um, items that are unknown at this time in the identified projects. Um, this is a slide that we showed you last time and I just wanna point out that we're focusing on that top line and the second line right now. The, the Irmo High School academic wing replacement is the portion of this funding as is the Chapin High School um, stadium expansion. The other items that are on this list are not part of the resolution that I'm bringing to you tonight. And you all received a copy of the resolution. It is also included on the website. So if you have any questions about that, I'll be happy to answer them. Any questions, Ms. Huddle? Um, I had a question in that the, um, the amount of the resolution is 49 million. <clears throat> but the debt limit is 46.9 and my understanding is the difference is the premium yes ma'am but I just wanted to make sure that I'm not a lawyer but I mean that we're still borrowing 49 million dollars so is there any concern that are we absolutely sure that we're allowed to do that to borrow more than the 46.9 Jay do you want to take that question yes I can address that can you all hear me okay yeah. yes Yes. Yes. Great. Madam Chair, School Board Trustees, Dr. Ross, again, this is Jay Glover from PFM Financial Advisors, and I appreciate you all giving me the opportunity to uh, participate here virtually. And you're exactly right. Um, when you issue a specific par amount of bonds, uh, $46.9 million in this case, the investors will provide you a premium for doing so. So you generate more proceeds than the actual par amount of the bonds. Uh, we've confirmed we have confirmed with bond council for Annie heiser that the eight percent debt limit is indeed related to the par amount of the bonds which in this case will be below the 46.9 million dollar limit and you are able to generate the additional proceeds that the investor would provide you so there's 
There was no legal issues related to that. And I think she'll provide an opinion to that effect at the closing of the bonds. That answer your question. Yes. Anybody else? Question? More. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I, I think you said we would get an, an official legal opinion in writing on that, right? We got, I, Jay and I both received an email today from Franny that it is appropriate and it is legal the way it is structured in this resolution. She will be with us on March 28th. Okay. Um, the other question I had is, um, so the two point, there's a maximum 2.5%. I think I saw that in the bond resolution. The eight years is not in the bond resolution itself. So I guess when we make the motion, we can establish that. But the other thing is the difference between the par and the premium. Can we specify that that difference is used to repay the debt or not? That, that, that difference will be used in the projects. Okay, so you're saying We're, the difference will be used in the projects. We need the $49 million uh, and that it will generate for the projects. Okay. Is that good, Ms. Huddle? Got it. Any, Ms. Anybody else down this way? Mr. Glover, um, isn't it the state law that that if if we use less than the than the amount of the total amount that we issue, that that whatever we use less than that first has to go to pay interest on on those uh, on on the offering? Yeah, I'm I'm not a lawyer, so I would need to defer to Franny on that. But generally speaking any excess proceeds that might not be used for a project can be used in general to make the next interest or principal payment. I'm not sure about the state law issue, but that is generally a legally permitted use. But I think in this case, uh, the plan is for the entire $49 million worth of proceeds to be used toward the projects that are being funded here, being the annual maintenance projects, as well as the you know, Irma High School addition. So there's not intended to be any excess proceeds once these projects are completed. But if they are, they could be used for that purpose. Well, my question is, if we had a contingency allowance and, and we didn't use that contingency allowance, that, that money would, ha according to what I've read with the, uh, the county, um, it has to go back to the county, and that is used for your first uh, interest payments that are required rather than and that go into some fund, uh, some, some uh, capital improvements fund. The um, opinion that I received from Franny Heiser a couple of months ago was that any time that you receive premium on bond sales, that they really don't have an attachment to it. It can be used for other capital projects, um, but I'm sure she would be happy to speak to that when she's here on the 28th. But it could only be used for capital projects that we vote on, right? Correct. Okay. You could rebudget the funds. If you, like, for instance, in this scenario, the, the contingency is in the annual maintenance. You could take that 200000 if none of it were spent, and you could put it towards the Irmo project. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on that? So, now this is um, under the discussion. So... Are we going to have a first reading vote? Yeah, I mean, it's up to you guys. We will be looking for second reading at the next meeting. Was the plan? So you would like a, 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 we, a first reading? If we vote. could do okay. discussion and first reading, yes, okay. ma'am. Do I have a motion, Ms. Ho? I move that we approve discussion and first reading of the bond resolution for spring bond issuance per Exhibit F. Is there a second? Ms. Gardner seconds. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is six and no opposed. So that first reading passes. 18, discussion on guiding principles on schools facilities. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I'll go through this um, quickly as we will have multiple discussions of this. I want to thank uh, PFM for uh, outlining how we're taking care of our first level of projects. and. Uh, all under providing uh, equitable learning environments uh, uh, to, for all of our students. So uh, this is a collaboration of all of our chiefs, so I really appreciate them. Uh, as was uh, established in our facilities committee, uh, we needed to kind of stop and look at guiding principles. 
that we would use in making decisions. And we uh, came up with a five-step process of a community analysis, facility need assessment, enrollment and projections, instructional plan review, and then wrapping that up into an overall plan. Each meeting, we will be going through each of these uh, one by one, step by step, so that you can see the decision making process uh, therein. Uh, and uh, not the next board meeting, but the meeting after that in April, uh, Dr. Harris will be bringing us uh, the professional uh, demographics of our, of our district. Uh, we have started with uh, economic trend study with our business advisory. We'll be meeting with the Chamber of Commerce and the legislative delegation. Uh, today, we'll just uh, park a little bit on our facilities needs assessment. Uh, we are arcing back to the 2019 MBCon report of 24 facilities in our building, uh, six rated fair, four poor. If you look at where these are, the red dots indicating where the rated poor facilities are uh, to signify uh, uh, the Irmo High School, Harbison West Elementary School, Nursery Road Elementary School, and the district office. Uh, we uh, brought to you back in November how uh, the life safety issues at the district office uh, increased the need uh, for review. And so uh, we have put the financing of that program ahead of the Harbison West and Nursery Road projects. And so in addition to the Irmo High School, uh, we've allocated uh, 16 uh, million for um, uh, addressing the life safety issues at the district office. We also have fair rated uh, buildings, Dutch Fork Elementary, Chapin High School, Crossroads, Dutch Fork High School, uh, and Irmo Middle School, as well as Seven Oaks. Uh, that we are also uh, looking at addressing. But before we can move to that, I think it's important, as we just heard uh, in public participation, that we have our key definitions outlined as a board, administration, and community, that we're all aligned on when we're saying what numbers, when we're using the word capacity, that we're talking about the same thing. We're not having to make any decision tonight, Madam Chair, members of the board. We're just getting an introduction discussion initially of these key definitions to make sure that we're saying the right thing and we're referencing or because numbers change and we don't want to be seen as we're, we're misleading the public. We just wanna make sure that we're clear on what definitions we're using. So very quickly, not to read every line item because I know everyone here can read, but just to go over an overview uh, we have a few definitions we want to bring uh, to your attention. The first one is the building condition. So when we talk about a building is an excellent, good, fair, or poor condition, we're looking at the MBCon study of, uh, of our buildings. When we talk about core capacity, uh, we are looking at uh, the, the areas uh, such as our media centers, cafeteria, multipurpose areas, gym, gymnasiums. Uh, so this is designed to um, accommodate the, uh, a, a, the maximum enrollment of that school. So the, uh, that's core capacity. Uh, not to be confused with program capacity. Program capacity is how we use those instructional spaces, uh, computer labs and special education areas. We'll show you a map later on today that, um, that, that really outlines the, that program capacity. And then when we talk about our students, we use various different numbers and in, in terms for how many students are in the building. Uh, ADA, which is average daily at, uh, attendance. That's a percent of uh, the attendance rate throughout the course of the year. While that's an important number, uh, we don't wanna confuse it with ADM, which is what uh, Marty uses in, in terms of our financing. So those numbers are reported uh, in terms of weights divided over the number of days, and that's how we, we look at our, our funding. We would like to use enrollment or what's called a head count, just a number of funded and unfunded students in the building. ADM looks at just the funded students, won't have the unfunded, like a three-year-old program. Well, when you are looking at um, our, our program capacity, and uh, enrollment slash headcount, those numbers are very important to determine facility needs. 
then these numbers change. Dr. Harris can tell you there is not one day where you could tell, like, uh, if we pull the number today of how many students are in there, we can pull it after lunch and that number's change. We can pull it the next day and that number's change. So we use very consistent reporting dates of attendance to make our decisions. Key decisions uh, for reporting head counts or enrollments or ADMs uh, are the 10th day of school, the 45th, the 90th, the 135th day, and the 180th day. Um, we make our budgetary decisions on the 135th day, and I, I'm looking to uh, Marty Rawls to correct me. We can adjust on that 45th day, correct? Yes, sir. The state adjusts funding um, after the 45-day count goes in. Um, the 135th day, I believe, is next week, so um, we're eagerly awaiting those numbers. And we'll be, um, they, the funding formula that we went over tonight, that will again be adjusted for that 135th day count, which will give us kind of final numbers. So as we go through these, thank you, uh, uh, Marty, on that, uh, Marty Rawls on that. So as we go through these reports, I just want, again, we don't have to make any decisions today, but let's look at program capacity, the enrollment head count on the 135th day. If we consistently use those date, um, those definitions as our decision-making metrics, I think that further uh, helps us understand the realities behind our decisions. Uh, there are also uh, gross square footage, and we're going to be asked, what's the square footage of the, uh, the space that we're using? And while gross square footage is important, I want to show you two schools and how they use gross square footage differently and why it's important to look at program capacity first. Um, uh, here's a, a picture on the left of Dutch Fork Elementary School designed in 1953. They take the gross square footage and they uh, cut it up into almost equal squares and rectangles and, and those are the classrooms. And then you see Piney Woods Elementary School uh, which opened in 2021. And you can see how that gross square footage is broken up into labs and special education areas and world language labs and studios and music uh, uh, rooms. You have uh, small group designs. So there's a different way, extended learning areas. Uh, how the square footage, uh, the gross square footage is used uh, is a function of that program capacity. So as we work through these key definitions, again, uh, doesn't have to, um, uh, no, no decisions are asked tonight, but I think we just start to, start to uh, digest and get comfortable on um, traditionally how buildings were, were laid out and decisions were made about program capacity and how we see uh, buildings today and how wings are designed today and uh, how programs uh, need multiple spaces and in order to operate efficiently. So we also uh, will be working through an instructional plan review. Uh, this is a uh, very labor intensive that looks at all of our programs uh, and, and how they um, use that space, how they meet the goals we heard from our uh, magnet programs. And uh, th these require, uh, we think about Montessori at one of the um, H.E. Corley that was just recognized today. That program operates totally different in its space uh, than a traditional classroom. And so um, our plan uh, that we will continue to bring to you over and over again is that no student or staff member will work in a fair or poor facility. And uh, we will use these uh, key definitions uh, to help us uh, make those decisions and work with our community to be very transparent on how we came up with our, our priorities. Uh, so with that, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, that is uh, just a discussion of those guiding principles of school facilities. And uh, I think we'll work with the facilities committee to kind of iron these out more. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Any question on any of that? Um, we appreciate that and I, I can, testify to the fact that there's been a lot of discussion every time we built a school about core capacity and program capacity. And I guess for those that wonder why you build it to a certain 
it'd be better when you're building it to say it's program capacity and then you don't have people that misunderstand that. But I remember we had to talk about that a lot because it does make sense to the taxpayer. If you built it for 1,200 people, you're, not, you're wondering why you wouldn't keep those kids at that school and you built it for that. So I, I, I think that it's an education process that you're explaining tonight and I, I hope this board, um, I look forward to the board discussing that and seeing what you do think is right and best for kids. Um, we are on 19, right? Uh, discussion and first reading proposed new board policy, DD, funding proposals, grants, and special projects, Exhibit H. Ms. Gardner. I move that we accept for discussion and first reading um, a new board policy, DD, funding proposals, grants, and special projects as shown in Exhibit H. Is there a second? Ms. Huddle seconds. You want to speak to that, Ms. Gardner? I can Gardner. speak to that. The, Dr. Ross and the administration brought this policy forward because we needed, um, among funding and grants and things like that, we needed a crowdfunding policy to make sure that the school district has a um, procedure and hierarchy involved so that we don't have things going on that we don't know about. And so this was proposed from the administration. So we read over it and we um, looked at the school boards association model policy I think it was, and um, we have wanted to adopt it as is. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll vote. All those in favor? And that is six to zero, so that half is for first reading. Um, 20, discussion and first reading, proposed new board policy, BC Board, Member Conduct and Commitment, Exhibit I. There is motion. Ms. Garner. I move for that we approve for discussion and first reading of a proposed new board policy, BC, board member conduct and commitment as seen in exhibit I. Is there a second? Ms. Huddle seconds. Um, you wanna speak to that? Is it pretty much the same? I know it's in blue writing. Is there a lot of change or it's the? Well, it's right now it's just the school boards associations uh, model policy mm -hmm. um, and we have a policy committee coming up this Wednesday and it's on it so we are going to discuss it in more detail okay. um, but we just wanted to get it we need to approve it as a new policy and then we will work on changing it so okay so this was taken as a model from the school board mm -hmm. so. okay any other questions on it all those in favor of and that is six to zero so that that'll move forward with your policy committee um, 21, discussion and first reading and proposed revisions to board policy BCA board member code of ethics. Do I have a motion for that? Do we have that one? Okay. <laughs> I can do that too. Um, we, I move that we approve for discussion and first reading of proposed revisions, revisions to board policy BCA board member code of ethics as seen in exhibit J. Is uh, there a second? Ms. Huddle seconds. Now, any discussion? Is that too the one that's basically adopted by the school boards association? It is. Um, we did add. We we discussed this quite extensively in our committee, uh -huh. um, and we did add specifically um, on the a section that stated, you know, um, well, I guess I could read it. There is a part that says that a board member should respect his relationships with other members by doing the following. And there's a statement that says, refusing to make statements or promises as to how he or she will vote on any matter. And then we added in which the board is presiding in a quasi judicial capacity and in which the matter should properly come before the board as a whole. Because we as a board felt that it was important that we were able to talk to our constituents about making, we make statements about what we would like to see happen, uh -huh. and this kind of prevented that. And whereas we're only uh, we're only asked not to make statements or promises when we're serving in a judicial role, which is one thing that we do as a board occasionally. And in those instances, we should not make decisions before we have been given the yes. proper evidence and that we're in together and have all the, the facts. Okay. Any other questions on that? Yes, Miss Hines. I have a question. Sure. Um, so in my board packet, there are. I guess I'm just trying to figure out what it is that we're approving. Um, it's marked like pages three and four, and they're based, they're two different, they seem very similar. I'm just trying to 
like I'll hold it up. Like there's one that has like all blue paint, blue, like yeah. all blue, I and then it. there's there's one that has um, like some of it marked out, and that's I think what Miss Gardner just read yeah. from. So I'm trying to figure out what policy, what page we're approving. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should probably explain to the first two pages are our are, is our current um, code of ethics that we have appropriated. Yeah, that would be the second one, all the blue that you see, that's what the School Boards Association recommended that we change it to back in 2019, but was not ever brought to our board. Right. So we, we, we agreed not that we should probably add those things. And so it basically takes out most of our old policy and adds all this new stuff in. But it is, none of that was changed. All the blue is the same. Um, there was nothing, that's, that is basically what the School Boards Association recommended, um, where we just got um, uh, whatever, well, and I guess I'm looking at this. Oh, I see now. Okay, so the second page is the, is what the School Boards Association recommended. The, the, uh, that's the third page, sorry. The fourth page is what we've recommended, and it's very similar to our original one, but it incorporates some of that stuff too. I see how, I, sorry, I'm getting confused about which policy we're looking at. I'm sorry. So there are that way you can see the difference. Our original, what the School Boards Association recommends, and then what we decided to, that we wanted to keep our original, but change some things. So that's what, um, the, the fourth page is the one that we were asking to adopt. So it- Fourth and fifth. Okay. Yeah, fourth and fifth. So it pretty much keeps our original, and then it adds a couple of lines that we liked. But we can decide as a board if we prefer you know, if there's something, if we need to change this to, I think that's why we have both. Dr. Ross is pointing, sorry. What, what I would recommend, uh, uh, Member Gardner, is because you have Wednesday's meeting coming up, mm -hmm. if you adopt page three, that gives the committee something to work on uh, for four and five. So we can come back and do pages four and five uh, at a later meeting. If if this committee, if the board adopts three, does that make sense? So, so I, I, but you would like just to give direction for your policy committee. You would like a first reading. Well, no, I. I mean, we've made. You, who do you want to call on? <laughs> well, Miss <laughs> Blackwood. I guess I'm, I just need clarification on that. If I mean, if we adopt page three for first reading and then we come back for a second reading for something that's in like right here that's like I, I mean to me that's totally confusing because the second reading is what is the final policy so I would I would like to know like what it is like you know what we're Which talking one about going into the them. second reading okay miss miss Garner well, I, I do I kind of agree I think there's a lot of differences here um, on this policy, we might need to not, I would recommend we don't vote on it tonight and then wait until Til, and, and bring it the, to policy the policy committee and then we will make sure that we bring the one that we want to be presented right. okay. to, because I think there is a little miscommunication because the one that we had decided as a committee might is not what is actually, on there. Well, it's not the school board's association model policy. Okay. So, um, that would not be what we were voting on originally. So. And that is on your, this is on your agenda for uh, Wednesday. For Wednesday, so yeah. Maybe even if somebody can't come, maybe they can put, they could at least uh, go in, because we do it virtually, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people can tune into oh, it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, so do public. I need to make a motion to move it to the next meeting? Um, well, let's see, we've got the motion on it and then we second it. Uh, How do we maybe stop amendment, the motion? Why don't you make it, a, to amend it to be brought to the next meeting? Is that good? Okay. Well. Or just vote this one down? Just withdraw the motion. Uh, or you can withdraw the motion. I would like to withdraw my motion. Okay. That we can, I can allow that, because you made the motion. Okay. <laughs> so we will wait to see what, we will not be confused on exactly what the policy is going to be that's brought before us. Thank you, though, for your work, Ms. Gardner, because mm -hmm. um, I know this is a lot of work. Um, 21. No, that was at 22. Oh, we're getting there. Discussion and first reading proposed revisions to board policy BCB, board member conflict of interest, exhibit K. These are the ones we've kicked down the can a few times, so we, we had to keep them on here. 
Yeah, Ms. Scott. Yeah, and that's, I apologize, that's the reason that we're confused about BCA is it's been on several, we keep kicking the can we, and we now have. I'm confused about it, but I think we're gonna. You've had them ready several out. times, I know that. <laughs> we keep changing our minds, okay. Um, so I move for, dis, uh, for that we approve discussion and first reading of proposed revisions to board policy BCB, board member conflict of interest. Okay, and there's second, Ms. Huddle seconds now. Any discussion? Is that pretty much, go ahead, Ms. Garner. Yeah, I mean, this one is laid out. It shows you our current policy and then the, the uh, changes that we've made. Um, there's a lot of wording differences. Um, I think we were concerned about nepotism and the, the definition of a family member and um, other conflicts of interest. And so we've kind of put a lot of these things um, into this policy and if we approve this, it makes the other policy that we just kicked the can down the road easier to put together because some of the things are in both policies. So we'll be able to remove them from the other policy. Um, it looks like a lot, um, but it's all laid out in there. It just talks about, you know, when a board member should recuse themselves when, when it comes to personnel matter and matters and things like that. Okay. I had read through it, so I, I, to me it looked all okay. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Hunt. I, I have a question about um, the where it says employment and volunteering prohibited, um, and it's talking about board members. How does this play into board members with children in school and like going and reading to a class or participating, um, you know, on a field trip or something like that? Which one is which? Is it, that it's the on third? This second page? Yeah. Okay. Like on like kind of towards the mid bottom, it says employment and volunteering prohibited and a board member is not permitted to be in a position in the district where they would have responsible for a curricular or co-curricular co extracurricular program or activity. Hmm. Well, and can I, can I talk, can I speak uh, to you that? You can answer to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so we did take out, and I see now that maybe that what might be a word we need to remove employment and volunteering prohibited, but if you read the paragraph, what it specifically states is that you can, it took the word volunteer out because um, when you're a volunteer, you're not directly reporting to a superintendent, principal, or an athletic director, or school administrator, unless you're in charge of a sport or something, which we basically said is wrong for us to do, but you're right, we should be able to, as board members, go into a, a classroom and help uh, reading or whatever needs to be done and that that is not reporting directly or okay. getting any um, you're not you're not in charge of anything I just wanted that clarification yeah. because so that's why that we took that word discourage parents yeah. from ever running for school board right. if they can't participate I agree um, yeah, so I, that volunteering prohibited might we might need to just put employment prohibited and volunteering I don't know how to we might have to change that wording just a little bit do you want to before we vote on that you want to okay I'll get let me finish this sentence. Um, do we want to, does that satisfy Ms. Hines, your point? It actually opens it up, yeah, whereas I, before I just, it was limited. I just wanted to, before I voted yeah. on it, I wanted yeah. to make sure that it was clear yeah. what it meant. Yeah, so I, I, I appreciate I it. I totally agree. We yeah. would never want a parent, because that's your first role, you know, mm -hmm. I, I get it. Um, so Ms. Gardner, you will, when, if, you'll, if you feel like that solved that, I appreciate that work on that. You want to, before we vote on this? Yeah. 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 Uh, Dr. Ross, I was at school the other day and um, somebody asked me whether I could be a mentor as a, as a board member. And um, if, if that goes to this question that we just had, can a board member also mentor students? Is that a volunteer or what is that? I think we need to give a little bit more study to it and, and ask for legal counsel. Uh, if you have any responsibility within the within the district for the safety and the welfare of a child, you're under the supervision of that principal. Mm -hmm. So I just I just want to make sure we are very clear on uh, on exactly how this uh, the intent of that that role is before I provide any guidance. I think that I think that we need to clarify that. Well, Ms. Gardner. It says directly report, not supervision. So we could put the wording in there that says all volunteers will still be under supervision of the superintendent or, or and let's, I mean, it says directly report, 
not supervision. Report directly means that you have a you have a responsibility. Someone's got a weight on your shoulders that requires you to be in charge of something. And as a volunteer, if you're just a mentor, you're just volunteering your time, and you don't have you don't have to report to anybody um, that you're you know volunteering. So that's kind of what that wording was supposed to be about. Is that Dr. Ross? Does that satisfy your <clears throat> thoughts on that you just said about checking on that? Or you want to still check on that? I, I would. I would like to you just get an opinion from um, okay. council. Uh, yes, okay. council. Ms. Huddle. Um, I don't want to alter the motion today, but um, I'm just curious about. There's a, a sentence that's been in there this whole time that says that a board member may provide services or sell products in the district in which he or she serves. And I've heard there's been a problem in the past with that. I think somebody's selling insurance or something. And it, it does say you have to recuse yourself from voting, but people could give a board member preferential treatment just because they're on the board. So I don't know how to address this. I mean, I know you don't want it, like if you're part of a company and that you're not deriving a financial benefit, but maybe we could look at that when we meet on Wednesday yeah. as if whether or not the board member's deriving a direct financial benefit. Could we look at that, Ms. Barney? Um, we can, but I still recommend we finish our first reading tonight. No, I agree. I, 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 yeah. okay. But we can, uh, we can make sure that we update those things for the next, because okay. it's very close. I think there's just a little bit of wording that okay. we'd like to look and at. And bring it back to us. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Hines. I was just going to second that. That was my second question, was that paragraph. I know that was in the original policy. I think that it should be removed completely, um, because board member, I don't personally don't believe that board members should ha do any business, regardless of recusal or anything. Um, I don't know that we would have to amend this motion if it, if policy re brought the second back. version back with those changes. I don't know, but that would just be my two cents I on agree. that. And I think you're right because when it comes back to us from her policy committee, it, it will be it, it will be in that vote and it can show it was removed. If, if so, if that's the will of the board in a vote. Okay, so we will approve this first reading to be realize that we may bring it back with some changes. All right, all those in favor? And that is six to zero. Mr. Hogan, <laughs> you are on. Chairwoman Hammond, I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? Ms. Huddle seconds. No discussion, right? All those in favor? I apologize for our late night, but we got good information. Meeting adjourned. We're just lucky it wasn't 100, 100 people.